So hello, my name is Ayana Chinesia Louie. Um, I am 20 years old and I'm currently a student at Carleton University. I study environmental studies with a minor in biology. I have a strong passion for learning about the environment, um, advocating for the environment. And I would love to get to a point in my own personal knowledge and my own journey where I can refer to myself as a traditional herbal medicine teacher. One day I'll be able to call myself that. In the meantime, I'm a student. Uh, I also enjoy music and singing and I hope one day I can also, um, as a career, uh, be a singer and music producer. I would also enjoy that a lot. So I am Ojibwe and um, my community is on Manitouan Island. It's called Chiging First Nation. And that's where my mother's side of the family comes from. My father's side comes from the Caribbean, uh, from Barbados. And my grandmother on my father's side moved to Canada in the 1960s um, by boat. And she was a nurse for many, many, many years. And um, somehow throughout all of that journey across um, from the Caribbean to Chugang First Nation, my mother and father met. And here I am speaking to you today. <laughs> That's me. Nice. Thanks, Diana. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us um, how you've come to know who you are? Like, how do you know who you are as being Ojibwe and as being from the, and having family and being from the Caribbean? So that's a question that I still ask myself to this day. Um, I've only had 20 years on this planet and that's a lot, but not enough to fully answer that question yet. Um, but some things that have helped me become more grounded in who I am as a person is um, through asking my family questions about their ancestors, who came before them and how they got to where they are now on both sides of my family, um, as well as engaging in conversation with um, other young native people, other young black people, um, other people from different ethnicities as well that are around my age and how they identify with themselves. Um, and as well as a lot of introspection, um, a lot of just asking myself, you know, what do I enjoy? What do I know? What do I want to learn more about? How do I express myself? Um, how have I changed as a human since I was a young girl to a young teen to now a young adult? Um, asking myself those deep questions and that so far has given me a sense, an idea of who I am and how I identify myself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a lot of work, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of conversations and what are some- and A lot of patience. A lot of patience. Yes. Yeah. Do you um, think you can share some of the things that have helped you understand who you are? Um, music. I, uh, and not particularly like radio music, mainstream pop. Um, I would say music from artists that are also indigenous or that are also uh, Caribbean or African and listening to the words that they say. Um, books reading has definitely helped. I purchased a book called Anishinaabe 101 from a small business in Pembroke. And uh, it just basically is a very, very brief reading about um, the traditions and cultures of the Anishinaabe people and their knowledge. Very, very brief. Once again, you can't fit all of that knowledge into one small book. So um, reading about that has helped me as well. Um, engaging in cultural activities, um, such as I remember the first time I I think the proper term is, is it dequilled a porcupine or quilled a porcupine? Is it dequilled a porcupine? Mm -hmm. Anyways, taking the, 
the sharp pokey things from a porcupine and um, eventually using that to make art and earrings and jewelry and other things that you want to use it for. Um, that was really eye-opening. I did that in the Youth Ambassadors program, which was a program for young Indigenous people um, in Man on Manitoulin Island. It was a summer program and it was filled with cultural activities um, as well as like learning about soft skills and hard skills that we can bring to the workforce. But that program really helped me um, engage in cultural activities that I wouldn't have been able to engage with otherwise because um, there wasn't as many opportunities like that in the city where I grew up in, which is Sudbury, Ontario. Um, nonetheless, though, I think engaging in those activities at a young age was a very good time too, because that's when, you know, your mind's developing and not that it finishes developing at 20 years old, I'm still going, but <laughs> um, just being introduced to that um, alongside other young Native people really gave me a sense of identity and a sense of place and like, I felt more connected to my community than I did before. And I still had, like, I still participated in cultural activities as a child, but um, not so much with other people my age. It was mainly just with older family members. So to do that with other young people was, it really helped me in finding out who I was, who I am. Yeah, absolutely. When those things are available to us and there's opportunities, especially with your, like you were saying, with your own age group, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the really important things you think that you took from, because you mentioned the Anishinaabek Youth Ambassadors Program um, and how that really helped you. So is there um, some other things that you can talk about from that program that really made you kind of look at it and go, oh, this is who I am. Like, this is really speaking to me. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed was m helping make the lodge that is still there today at um, the location of the program. Um, being a part of that was hard work and uh, it required a lot of teamwork. So everyone was working on something different all at the same time, um, whether it was like sewing the the bark or even or like going on to the structure and like placing it on um on the like it was yes. everyone had a job to do and being able to like be a part of that was a really grand experience and I'm happy that when I go back to Chigang and I go back to that lodge I like see myself not only like in the lodge, but as the lodge itself. Like I feel like I am that lodge when I look at it. And it just makes me feel even more connected and grateful to be able to be a part of that. Um, and then also with that program, I got to learn a lot of um, knowledge about the land around us. So we had different people from different groups and different organizations organizations come in and teach us what they were experts about. So there's people that came in um, that taught us about canoes and canoe safety. And then there was people that taught us how to build a canoe, build our own canoe. Um, there's people that came in that taught us about jam preserves and how to preserve food and also how to gut a fish. Like there's a lot of different people that came in and there's a lot of knowledge that was shared. Um, and because of that knowledge being shared, I was able to basically just get a glimpse of what life was like before colonization. Um, because I, even though like knowing those cultures and knowing those practices, like it's not as, it's not the exact same as it was before settlers came into this land, just because there's been such a grand change. And like now when I'm hungry, I go to the fridge instead of, you know, going to hunt. So there's a big, big difference in how we live our life now. And just being able to learn about those, our, our traditional practices 
um, makes me feel more connected to my blood and my ancestors and how we how we live. Yeah. So the next thing, um, miigwech for sharing. And one of the really important things I really loved what you said about was that you were not just um, an active participant in building that lodge, that you feel like you are the lodge. And that that is just really beautiful. And it's really poignant a way of explaining the importance of, of experiencing who you are rather than um, just being told this is who you are. You're actually experiencing it. So that's really, it's really powerful sharing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I kind of want to talk about the, the aspects of racism. And we know that there has been in the recent past, in the recent past, there's been a lot of things that have happened and we know each other. You're my niece. I'm your auntie. We've had a lot of conversations about these type of things in the in the most recent past, right? And so can you tell me um, if you're comfortable and what you're comfortable with talking about, if you've ever experienced racism, um, either through your own lived experience or something that you've seen in your in your in your time frame? Yes, so um, I'm very lucky to have not experienced racism to the extent where I was physically harmed um, or felt as though I couldn't show up somewhere again. So I'm unfortunate to say, but I am lucky that I have not experienced that. Mm -hmm. I have experienced countless microaggressions, um, countless interactions with people my age, but also older adults. Um, when I was a schoolgirl, like teachers and even employers uh, that have made me feel uncomfortable. So if I were to mention a few just off the top of my head, um, in school, one of the biggest things that made me feel uncomfortable was about our education system. And this was in Sudbury, so this is the Ontario Catholic District or School Board. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but it was a Catholic high school in Ontario, mm -hmm. in Sudbury. Um, and it was our grade 11's world religions class. And up until that point, nowhere in my, in my classes have I learned about Native people in Canada. Um, and I remember we had, we were looking at the, the outline for the semester and what we're gonna be talking about. And we were gonna talk about Hinduism, Buddhism, Catholicism, all of these world religions. And we had a certain amount of weeks that we were studying each one. And I remember trying to find them like, well, with all this world religion, like, are we gonna talk about one of like the most, um, Are we going to talk about one of the most dominant cultures, I would say, in our own land of Canada? And we did. Um, and I, I found that we were going to talk about um, Indigenous peoples of North America. I was really excited about that. We ended up only talking about, about that for half a class. And then that was the last time I heard about it. And I was very, um, I felt cheated. Like I felt like we didn't matter. I felt like I didn't matter. Um, and all of these other religions and cultures and groups of people had a higher placement above me because we didn't even spend a quarter of the time on um, indigenous, indigeneity that then we did on, you know, religions that weren't even like founded essentially in Canada. So like that definitely made me feel less, less than. Um, and I, sh sometimes I look back on it in high school and I regret not speaking up, but at the same time, you know, I was a different person and back then I can't hold that regret. So I let that go. Um, but yeah, that was like one of the 
one a big thing that really made me feel crappy because we didn't even talk about it it was basically just like a few conversations read on not at conversations a few slides shown in class about native people in Canada and then it was on to the next topic um, so that was one thing that was really frustrating in my educational system um, another was just like and the thing is, I used to be very frustrated about this, but I also recognize that in high school, everyone's still a kid and I can't necessarily like blame other kids for not knowing, but just like utter disrespect for my hair, like 100%. It's hair that is not seen by, as not as common because in Sudbury, it's mainly white people and at Catholic schools in Sudbury, it's like 99% white people um, who haven't been exposed to other cultures. Like I'm sure if I went to a high school in Toronto, I would have had a much different experience. Um, but yeah, so just like disrespect from teachers and um, other students for my hair, touching it when I, they didn't ask or even um, making comments about it that weren't necessary definitely made me feel ashamed my hair and how I choose to wear it and how I choose to express myself. Uh, I held on to that shame for a long time. And I think only now am I beginning to let it go. Um, another thing is at school, um, because I look I find that when that my look like how I physically look like pertains more to how you would envision like a stereotypical mixed black girl. Um, but when people see me, I don't think that they see that I'm also native as well. And they just assume that I'm black mixed with white. Um, so there was a lot of disbelief from teachers and students that I was native. Uh, it was like I had to prove myself by showing my status card. And um, I wish I understood the, like how unnecessary that was at the time. But once again, I was like 15, 14, I didn't know. Um, but now I know that I will never argue with anyone else about who I am <laughs> because I know who I am, they don't. So yes, there is just like a lot, a general um, disbelief that I was native. And when, if I, if I mentioned it, they would ask like, how, how native are you? Like going back to blood quantum. Mm -hmm. um, so after like, so that was a lot of what I experienced in high school at my high school. And, uh, but I don't take any of it personally anymore because I recognize that I was also like, I was young and the people I was talking to were young as well and they didn't know and a lot of times I didn't know either so I don't take it personally mm -hmm. yeah what about um observing racism around you have you observed acts of racism around you or in the media or I mean, we're so inundated with so many pieces of media now, like through phones and laptops and then, and so we can access a lot of different things and a lot of different information all over. So what about um, racism that you've observed? So I've observed many acts of racism uh, so far in my lifetime. Um, growing up, I would watch my dad be racially profiled when um, the cops would stop him um, in public, uh, question him. Um, my dad is a dark skinned man. He's a pretty big man. He's pretty tall. He's, he, at least at the time he was pretty buff. <laughs> and, uh, so that was taken as a threat to a lot of white males, um, white females. Um, I didn't necessarily see other people of color questioning him the way that white people did. Um, so I can confidently say that the people that questioned him were definitely intimidated by him. 
uh, just because of his skin color, just because of his size, just because of how he expressed himself. He played hip hop music um, loudly <laughs> in his car. So uh, once again, all these stereotypes around him led uh, him to be racially profiled. And I would see that as a child. And I remember this one instance, um, he got pulled over in Sudbury. Um, I was in the back seat and the police car pulled him over asking, you know, like asking him questions, basically a, a dancing around the, the idea that he may be a drug dealer. Um, and I just remember, and I knew at the time when I was a kid, like I didn't really understand the greater idea of racism, but I knew why my dad was stopped because all of the police officers that stopped him were white. Not a single colored person ever stopped him. So I saw that from a young age. Um, and then growing up on the media, tons of racism uh, on social media. I can't remember like specific, specific times, but there's tons of it everywhere. Um, just in necessarily like in racism where you're calling someone um like calling someone names uh based on their race but like just like lack of representation um that has definitely led me to believe that black people indigenous people um mexican people indian people anyone who is of a darker skin tone does not deserve to, you know, have a camera on them, doesn't deserve to be heard, listened to, admired. Um, so that led to a lot of internalized, what I would, what I would call internalized racism. So I would believe that I wasn't enough because I was darker skin tone. And I would idolize people that were white and had long blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, and then, but since then, like that happened a lot when I was easily influenced as a child. Um, and I'm sure many other people that look like me uh, can relate to that. Um, as I got older towards like a teenager, um, I, I started to notice a lot of racism aimed towards my brothers. And I think that there was a difference in our experiences because I'm a woman and because they're men. And however that works out in other people's minds, I don't know, but in my mind, I think that I got a bit less like, oh, I don't wanna say like my racism was like less, had a less effect on me because racism is racism, all of it is wrong. But I think like, because they were men and they were black ma males, they were seen as more intimidating than a black female. I don't know, mm -hmm. black and indigenous female. I don't know, anyways, because, um, so yeah, I would see a lot of, and still today, I actually just had a conversation with my older brother today about um, something racist that happened to him uh, a couple of years ago. So I see it a lot with my brothers, uh, especially when they're playing sports uh, in high school, uh, just comments that were made towards them, or they would tell the, at the end of the day, they would come and tell my mom something that happened at school between a teacher or between another um, teammate's parent. I would see, yeah, I would just hear it a lot um, within my family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you played a lot of sports as well. Did anything come up in any of the in any of the sports or in any of the uh, the teams that you were involved with? Um, no, I can't say I know for sure. Um, but I've definitely there's one instance in high school where I played flag football, um, and my coach uh, made me feel really uncomfortable because he would always, whenever we saw each other in the halls, he would always sort of fetishize being indigenous and being black. He would always say, Ayanna, you are so beautiful. You have so much beauty around you. You have the black thing going on. This is exactly what he said, like verbatim. You have the black thing going on. You have the native thing going on. 
And yes, that's like maybe a nice compliment if you say it once, but to say it every single time we see each other in the hallways and then to make a comment where he thinks that I should, his son was also a student at the school saying that because I have this beauty in me from my ethnicities, I should um, pair up with his son. That's just extremely inappropriate, uh, very inappropriate. And to me, it felt like I was being fetishized. Um, because of my ethnicities and it made me really uncomfortable. And that was a coach. That's someone I'm supposed to like be able to talk to if I like need, I need help in school or need help with my sports. Um, so I wouldn't say I've experienced like racism from teammates or other coaches. I think that was like the only experience I've had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's so many different facets, I think, of, of racism, oppression um, around being Indigenous. I can only speak from the Indigenous aspect from about being Indigenous. And certainly you've touched on a lot of them. Like there's things that, that we, we second guess and we think when people say things to us um and then we have to kind of like you were saying we kind of have to work through it in our in our own selves in our own minds right and or talk to it with other people or talk through it with other people and then having to feel safe enough to talk to to talk through it with other people that's a whole other thing as well right Mm -hmm. um I remember there was a time when you were I think in public school and And this is a really interesting and important piece of this. So I'm not sure if you remember this and maybe you do, but I remember there was a time when you were in public school and you were taking an Ojibwe class. You were learning Anishinaabemun. Do you remember what happened around that class? Like, where did you take the class? Um, What happened? How did you get to class? Those type of details. Because maybe I think that there's something really important in that too, if I can remember it correctly. Um, We were... And yeah, so that was like my first Ojibwe class that I took in school. I was in grade one at the time um, at Lansdowne Public School. And we were taken out of the people who registered to be in Ojibwe class. Um, It had to happen during the school day, obviously. So... Oh, thank you. Main class Sorry. to go <laughs> down to the news. Oh, tell me when I'm back. You're back now. Okay, what was the last thing you heard? They can edit all that out. Um, you were in grade one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and the people who registered for a Dubai class, they had to be taken out of their main classroom to go into a separate Ojibwe classroom and learn there. Um, and it would happen about twice a week. And I was taken out of my English class. That's an English class because I was a French student and uh, I don't, I like French, but like, I didn't always, I really enjoyed my English time because then I got to speak fluently in English. So like, I didn't have to worry about French. Anyways, that's the time of day that we were taken out to go down to Ojibwe class. And like in English class, we always had like books to read and, there's a lot of like engagement with the class. And I was always sad to be taken out at that time to go to Ojibwe class. And it got to the point where I would say no to Ojibwe class because I wanted to stay in my main classroom. But I didn't like at the same time, I didn't like the fact that like I had to choose between the two. Um, so that's that was my experience with going to Ojibwe class in grade one. Yeah. And that's really important and especially important for um schools teachers educators the curriculum understandings uh, and and how we and how we engage students in classroom and classroom time um, mm-hmm. so that's really important so i really appreciate you sharing that part of it and and i'm, I'm amazed that you remembered it. it was like grade one <laughs> i don't know i don't know if i remember too much about grade one so <laughs> good on you for remembering that um so what do you think given the things that you have experienced things that you've observed things you talked about what do you think that all Canadians need to know or all people in Ontario need to know to help fight um 
racism? Um, I think they should be made aware of the land that they're standing on and what that land was before all of the atrocities happened to indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And then in, in addition to that, I think they should also know about those atrocities that happened. Um, they should be made aware of, like it, to me, it boggles my mind that there's people walking around that like don't even know residential school was a thing. Um, but thing is, I can't be upset with them because it's not like it's their fault. It's what they were taught in school. Like they weren't taught that. Um, so I think they should be made aware of that. And then not just in a brief conversation, but like a pe over a period of time, like over a length of time, I think it should be talked about. It should be um, even dissected to the point where, you know, we f figure out why it happened, who was involved, how many people were involved, what that led to down the road, not just like, because it didn't just stop there once the last residential school closed. Oh, you froze again. Trauma was tied down. Oh. Tell you, me when I'm back. You're back and you froze at once. It didn't stop at once residential schools were closed. Yeah. So the, the, the trauma and, and the information and the knowledge didn't stop once the last residential school closed in, in 96. It was passed down in, within systemic racism. And that was, and then that has effect now on our, on, on how Indigenous people in Canada express themselves and, and, and oh. in their language. And you froze again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can you go back to, I just want to see if you can get, if we can get it, because this is really important. So I want to see if we can get a really clear um, idea of what you're saying here. And you're back, so start with, um, it didn't end at when the residential schools closed. Okay, so yes. The pain, the trauma, the knowledge, the information about Indigenous people did not end when the last residential school closed in 1996. Systemic racism continued. Intergenerational trauma continued. And both of those still exist today. And both of them have an effect on how I express myself, how my brothers express themselves, how my grandmother expresses herself. Um, it has an effect on how I'm able to identify. Like, I feel like there's a lot of things that I have to look at when I look in a mirror. It's not just like, it's not just 20 year old, student it goes a lot deeper than that it goes through all of what my mother's side went through it goes through all of what my father's side went through so I think going back to the original question because I'm gonna end up just talking for like an hour here um I think that people in Canada especially older people because I know we put a lot of pressure on the youth to like be the ones to change things but right now it's the older people that are in positions of power I find at least obviously like everyone should know about um indigenous history um but I really feel like people in positions of power which are educators teachers um, administrators, politicians, I feel like those people really need to know and made aware of what happened in Canada, not just Canada, but all of North America, and how that affects us today. Because it doesn't just affect me, it also affects them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What do you mean it also affects them? Well, I think if you're going to be working alongside other Indigenous people, you're also going to be working alongside. Hold on, let me put this in a way that makes sense. That's all right. Take your time. 
because clearly we're affected by it. They're going to edit this out. So clearly we were affected by not knowing these things and not being educated with them and within the school systems. Um, on from my perspective as an indigenous person and from your perspective as a as a indigenous person and as a black person, we don't we don't go through those things in in school curriculum. And if we do, it's it's not to the extent that we understand how Canada was formed, who the prime ministers were, uh, the railroad, um, all these different things, right? Uh, the geography, the way the land looks, like we remember that how they break us off and like you color in all the different provinces with a pencil crayon so you can remember them. Um, you know, the borders that come along with the provinces, things like that. We, that's what we we're educated in um, as much as I can remember. I don't remember black history and I don't, and I certainly do not. And I know I do not remember any indigenous um, history or stories or black stories or um, of that contributed to the place that we now know as Canada. Mm -hmm. um, or even that we're still here, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. or that we're a significant part of, of that whole story of how this nation became through other nations that were already here, right? Um, so that's, I think that's, uh, so how is it, you were gonna talk about how it affects other people by not knowing those things? I just think like, we're starting to see more diversity. We're starting to see more people of color in um, systems and areas where you wouldn't, they wouldn't have necessarily been in, 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 in like in the past. Um, and I think like it's inevitable that you're going to work with or go to school with or play with or be on a sports team with people of indigenous heritage. Um, and you're gonna be like in the same areas of, as them, as us. I don't know why I'm saying them, as us. <laughs> so I feel like if you want to be a friend, if, if, if you want, if, <laughs> I'm basically saying that it's inevitable that you're going to, that, that, yeah, that, oh my goodness, this is so hard to say. <laughs> I know sometimes it can be difficult to formulate the, you feel what you're thinking, you, you know, you like, you sense that there's something there, but it can be really hard to like formulate it into words. Um, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you were saying it's inevitable that people are gonna interact with indigenous people? Yes, it's inevitable that non-indigenous people are going to interact with indigenous people. Um, and I think that it's non-indigenous people's duty and responsibility to just be aware and, and know and understand what it is that indigenous people have gone through and continue to go through in order to be an ally, in order to change the narrative, in order to create a more inclusive and safe space for indigenous people and all people of color um, to live in and to work in and to play in and to be accepted. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think yeah. that summarizes really my thought. Yeah, that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really awesome, Ayanna. Thanks for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, do you think things are changing in the area of racism? Hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, I would say that I've seen changes um, from when I was a kid to now. Uh, certain things just like I don't hear as often like blatant um, discriminatory words like 
just aren't said, at least around me, as much as they were when I was a child. Um, but I can't necessarily think of any other examples. No, that's okay. I definitely see it. Like, think I see more diversity. Mm-hmm. That's about it. What do you see yeah. in your in university <clears throat> that's different from public school in terms oh, yeah. of policy around racism or experiences around racism or uh, what what are they promoting? What are they not promoting? That type of thing. So one thing that I have been very happy to see, and I'm not sure if this is just for my program or if it's for other programs, I really hope it's for other programs. Um, But in my environmental studies program, um, I've seen in many classes since, probably since my second year, um, Indigenous Learning Bundle. Oh, you just passed again at Indigenous Learning Bundles. Yeah, so we um, have been, I've seen Indigenous Learning Bundles, and each bundle that I've seen, it pertains mo- like more information that's like related to the class that I'm taking. So we did one where I was in a bio, what was it called? I think it was a biodiversity course. So it was more really related to um, biology and the sciences, but uh, we did a learning bundle where it was about traditional, um, tradi- traditional envir- ecological knowledge. That's what it was. And we got to see, um, basically look at biology from an indigenous perspective. And then another class that I had was um, Canadian geographies of the North. So we looked at Northern Canada um, in the territories. And um, with that, we're, we haven't opened it yet. It's actually our next project, but it's an indigenous learning bundle on the geography of the, of the North of Canada. Um, So I'm really excited to look into that. Uh, But so far, I've seen um, more of um, more inclusivity of Indigenous perspectives. Um, We've uh, we've had in several classes had um, had Indigenous educators come in and speak. So I'm really happy to see uh, more of more of that being integrated into the classroom because that's a heck of a lot more than I've ever seen in any other point in my um, education so far. And you think that those including these things, you know, when you were in the session with Joe Pidwanaquit? Yeah. Was that part of your classroom or was that something you just did on your own? That was something I did on my own. Okay. Is that something that you could see that would belong in your in your program? that it would fit in your program somewhere yeah yeah so those things are really important for sure and it's nice that there's learning bundles coming out and that people are delivering these things and they're bringing these ideas and and knowledges into the classrooms and and post-secondary classrooms as well as secondary because i know that there's bundles in secondary and and elementary as well so that's really important do you think that those things are helping to change racism in education yeah i think just being more aware Um, of it just allows like students to yeah just I feel like being more aware just allows you to like respect it more because you know where it's coming from and you know that you know your friends and your classmates and your peers indigenous or not um okay I don't know where I'm going with that (laughs) I lost my train of thought Sorry, I'm in the classrooms and indigenous knowledge is in the classrooms helps. Yeah, I think those indigenous knowledge in the classroom and those bundles and and educators coming in that are indigenous themselves to speak just um, helps paint the picture better of who we are as a nation. I feel like just getting that like firsthand experience um, and in and, and in the classroom um, helps mm-hmm. pe- make people more aware. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And when we're aware, we can make different decisions, right? We can make mm-hmm. more informed decisions, or we can have at least a different opportunity to look around and critique things or look at things differently or see, di- see things differently yes. or hear things differently, right? Yeah. As opposed to the, the one dialogue. Um, they'll probably edit that out. <laughs> maybe they will, maybe they won't. I don't know. But um, so we're just going to 
talk about this last and final piece and then if there's anything else you want to share about that um, or about this whole conversation then feel free to do that but so the last thought is we talked about racism and how it has affected you things you've seen things you've experienced um, things you've experienced with family members um, that have happened to family members all sorts of things, um, the difficulty and the challenges that it takes to understand who a person is and who we are as Indigenous people, um, with you as an Indigenous and Black person as well. Um, so there's a lot. It's a it's a lot to go through, and I really appreciate you taking your time and 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 trying to explain some of this. And it's really important. It's really really important the the ideas and the thoughts that you've put forth here. So I really appreciate that. Um, what do you think? are some of the steps to changing this will be, to changing racism, to changing those things, all those things that you talked about. What are some of those real solid steps, like real concrete steps that you think that people can take or that or that schools can take or education can take or um, um, anything like that? I think it should be mandatory to include like a native studies course, um, in high school. Um, I also think it should be mandatory in elementary as well, because right from, you know, the get go of the education system, we can uh, just inform students, children, teens, uh, just more about indigenous cultures and traditions. Um, and I feel like that would just overall create a, a general like level of respect mm -hmm. for indigenous people. Um, I think that would really help bring an end to racism, not only systemic, but just social, socially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Having um, exposure to understanding the vast diversity of who Indigenous people are across this land that we now call Canada. Mm -hmm. but there are many nations that are living here and have always lived here from the very beginning of time. Mm -hmm. Their creation stories start on the land. Um, and uh, and it, it includes the sky, it includes the stars, it includes the, the, the universe, it includes the world underneath the land as well. Like all of these things combined within creation stories tell us and connect us to who we are. And when we can stand firmly grounded in who we are, we can then, um, I would think, I think as indigenous people, when we stand firmly grounded in who we are, then we can have these challenging conversations with other people. We can have these emotional or conversations with other people or difficult conversations with other people and not, um, and the, it's, it's about being informed, right? It's about being informed and then you can have those conversations based on fact and not on emotion, right? And I think that that's a big, that's a big piece around this um, is having young people, like you said, having mandatory indigenous knowledges and education in, in elementary schools is super important. Um, do you think it could be done within each classroom or within each subject? Yeah. Or do you think a, yeah, you think it could be done throughout each subject. So then it doesn't look like, oh, here's your indigenous education for the day, right? Mm -hmm. It's incorporated within, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. Every subject, every day, yeah. And then, um, and what do you think about at university? Do you think it's a mandatory thing? It should be mandatory at university? I think so too. Yeah. And I can see how it can be incorporated into almost every um, program. Mm -hmm. And then once young people or adults, because not just young people go to university, clearly. <laughs> adults, I was an adult when I went to university. Um, when people come through those systems, elementary, um, secondary, post-secondary, graduate school, they're gonna be the ones most likely, um, you think at policy changes, and then we can see if those things are mandatory all the way through, those policies and those other systems could then possibly be 
really uh, looked at in a different way as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, is there anything else you want to add in around racism? You just want to give a quick rant out about how much racism has affected your life or what you've seen or the things that you're angry at or, <laughs> or anything you just want to literally add in there? Um, they'll probably edit out that big yawn you just did not stretch. <laughs> uh to finish mm -hmm. off i just want to say thank you kimmy kimberly for speaking with me today i think that these conversations are absolutely 100 percent necessary and um they highlight and uphold the voices of indigenous black people that need to be heard and of course, my experience doesn't speak for all of those who identify as Indigenous and who identify as Black. Um, but I think that me speaking here today uh, can definitely help shape the world that we want to live in and the education system that we want to see in the coming years. So thank you. Can I just ask one more question? Considering you just, you just made me think of it just as you were saying that, how has this conversation helped you or has it? Um, it's helped me reflect um, back on some of the negative feelings that I've held on to because of my experiences growing up um, pertaining to racism and education. Uh, me speaking today was the first time I said that I don't hold what um, some classmates have said to me or done to me personally, um, because looking back at it now, like, we were young kids and none of us really knew the extent of like what we were saying, like how much power that that held. So um, I just, through this conversation, I've been able to do some self-reflection and I appreciate that. Because mm -hmm. these questions were deep. They involve a lot of looking at yourself deeply. Yeah. Absolutely. I find, um... And again, this part may be edited out, but uh, I find when we have these conversations, it helps us to heal. Mm -hmm. When we reflect back on ourselves and we think, what is mine to carry and what is not mine to carry? Mm -hmm. What can I uh, do about it? Or is there, if there's anything I can do about it, and if there's not, then it doesn't, we don't need to carry it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but I appreciate having these conversations too, because it makes me really reflect on, on, on my life and my role and where I'm at and appreciate um, the people that I have around me that have had these conversations with me um, and that have supported me through it. And it uh, helps me become, like I'll go into school as a teacher the next day, tomorrow, like even different, right? Um, a little bit more different, a little more aware, a little more thoughtful. Um, and it really just kind of resonates. Everything you said just kind of reminds me about why I'm doing what I'm doing and the importance of that. And, um, and hearing young voices like yours, that hearing young voices like yours, um, you're being my niece aside, hearing young voices like yours gives me, gives me hope that things are going to change as even more than what they are changing already. I've seen a lot of changes in the past, uh, um, you know, 30 years. I'm 50 now. So the past 30 years from when I was 20, when I was your age, I've seen a lot of changes happen. Um, but maybe the more that these things get implemented in our school systems, the more young people will have experiences that are different than ours. And they're going to have that on a continual basis, hopefully, um, the education and the knowledge through, uh, through work that's being done like these videos and these conversations. Um, so that way they, they can change those systems. They can be part of those changes. Mm -hmm. The other thing that makes me think about these things is the fact that maybe you and I in our lifetime, we may not see the full extent of these conversations and changes that need to take place. But the fact that we're part of them and putting them in motion is really important and really powerful. Like it's really, it's, uh, it's really healing. And, and, I'm, and I hope that you're really proud of yourself, you know, and I say proud, but I hope you feel good that um, you're at where you're at and you're thinking about these things. I'm really proud of you for being a young person already in this thought process because I wasn't there where you're at now. I wasn't there at 20. And uh, 
and it took me a little while longer to get there, but I'm really glad and grateful. I should say that glad and grateful um, that you're at where you're at and that you're thinking about these things and it's really important to you. And I know that's just going to push you further to understand them a little bit more and make those changes in the world and in your world, at least anyway, and, and the world around us through mm-hmm. understanding these things in a different way and seeing things in a different way. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm really grateful for that. Thanks, Diana. Thank you. Thanks for hanging out with me and having these conversations. I really appreciate it. Yeah, me too. It was a good talk tonight. Yeah. Bye, Mom P. Bye, Bye, Mom. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.